So next up, Gregory Melitonov is a founding partner at Taller Ken based in New York City and Guatemala City. He earned his Master's of Architecture at the Yale School of Architecture and worked for Toshiko Mori Architect and Renzo Piano Workshop before starting his own office. Taller Ken is a very active building practice, having realized dozens of projects in Latin America and has been awarded the New York New Practices Award from the AIA. The work of Taller Ken is exuberantly colorful, rich with playful material choices and carefully calibrated to its locales. The practice cultivates resourcefulness, finding ways of creating beauty and surprise, sometimes with very limited budgets. Public space projects such as Playa Chomo and Barrio Girona speak to this determination and ability to create moments of wonder even in neglected spaces. So bring you Greg. Um, so thank you to the Architecture League and to thank you to the various friends and family and supporters um, that are here. Uh, I'm Gregory Melitonov and uh, I am one half of Tayer Ken um, or Taller Ken. And uh, the firm is a Spanglish mashup of the word taller, uh, Spanish for workshop, and the English word ken, meaning knowledge or understanding. And uh, so baked into our practice is kind of an attention to the um, physical object of architecture and also somewhat of a broader perspective of, of knowledge or understanding. Um, the uh, biggest thank you goes to my partner, Ines Guzman. Um, we've been uh, working together as a firm for six years now and have known each other for nine years. And so it's uh, one of the most fruitful collaborations. Um, hopefully you agree. <laughs> but um, also, woohoo. Uh, also, it's a little crazy sometimes. Uh, also, um, we uh, have a somewhat, um, let's say, playful dynamic that uh, plays out in the work, but also uh, we kind of embrace a naive approach to architecture, which allows us to be both um, uh, local and outside, both um, foreign and um, uh, native, and so we uh, try to always see things from multiple vantage points um, and produce something that's hopefully uh, unexpected and unforeseen. Um, I'm a big believer in the narrative power of architecture, um, the role of the architect, uh, and the role of architecture in the public realm. And I believe through some kind of a narrative, we can um, stimulate somewhat of a broader discussion. Um, so the story of Ines and I uh, begins in Genoa, Italy, uh, where both of us uh, were um, working for Renzo Piano. So um, this idea of the uh, sort of hands-on and the, and the personality that comes along with um, working for someone who's been at the top of the field for more than 40 years um, was uh, an, an extremely um, unique opportunity. Uh, and um, I guess uh, the biggest thank you also goes to Renzo, who was kind enough to uh, send us a handwritten congratulations that arrived through customs um, <laughs> from Italy. So, uh, grazie mille. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we were both uh, in Renzo's um, sort of, uh, if, uh, if you are an architect, you probably know something about the mystical bungalow um, of Renzo Piano, uh, an extremely um, cloistered environment uh, where one is able to um, train in almost a... Uh, medieval craftsman-like <laughs> style, uh, but also um, it, it, it attracts um, a large amount of international young talent. Uh, Renzo supports uh, the voice of young people um, at a level that I uh, haven't seen in, in any of the other uh, places that uh, I've worked or, or spoken with um, my peers. And the um, 
uh, just the just the exposure uh, to so much young talent um, from all over the globe was inspirational to us uh, as we um, developed our pa practice going forward. Um, Ines and I both were design architects for the Whitney Museum's new location in downtown New York, and uh, we uh, were very fortunate um, to be involved in the process from the initial sketches all the way to the uh, topping off of the uh, building when we began working for ourselves. Um, and so just being able to see uh, one fast track project all the way through uh, and then two years later be open to the public, uh, again, another, another very unique experience. So um, obviously, uh, especially at the tail end of the, uh, of the recession. And <clears throat> uh, so having uh, such a important work of civic architecture uh, and being able to um, visit it uh, almost uh, weekly when I'm in the city and, and see how this piece of uh, work has grown into the um, urban fabric is uh, very interesting, but also how something that is um, extremely commercial is able to take on a life uh, and meaning beyond the, the physical object. Uh, on the right here, you see a, a limited edition handbag by Max Mara that's uh, inspired by the, um, by the ribbing uh, of the exterior facade material. And then recently for the uh, biennial opening, the museum itself was occupied as a space of protest. Um, so how how the how the the edifice ends up playing um, out these these larger roles is is interesting. Um, and sort of in kind of a in kind of a, a reaction to that, um, when Ines and I moved on to do our own thing, we kind of um, started from scratch working um, with. Uh, low cost materials that had a high visual impact. It's kind of a, an idea um, that's born out of necessity, uh, trying to do more with less. And uh, actually, the story kind of begins uh, working even before we left uh, Renzo's office. Um, the group of young people, uh, extremely talented from all over, um, also have share a, an obvious passion for architecture besides um, besides Renzo's work, and so we uh, began. We uh, had to commute uh, to this uh, bungalow, and we're always um, taking this urban highway, the Sopra Levada, which cuts through downtown Genoa, and um, just as a way to kind of um, keep ourselves uh, occupied as a hobby, uh, ended up doing a, a sort of side project where we. Um, came up with an idea to make T-shirts to draw attention to some of the urban issues that the um, that the highway created between uh, migrant communities uh, who sold their um, sort of uh, bootleg purses um, by the harbor and uh, and city people who kind of used the highway but didn't really appreciate the downtown. Uh, I won't get into all of it, but essentially. Uh, this kind of first project um, was uh, a one-day installation where we hung up some t-shirts and uh, created a space to talk about um, the city. And uh, again, you see kind of uh, young people pitching together, do it yourself, and um, ended up uh, just generating conversation. Uh, Italy comes across as a very homogenous place. Genoa is a port city. It's very, actually very diverse, especially at the waterfront. Um, and so different uh, communities kind of uh, uh, came together to, to talk about the city and to wear some t-shirts. And it was all a hoot. Anyway, um, so we uh, started our practice really in Guatemala City. Um, this is not a place that I was familiar with uh, before um, my first project <laughs> was, was uh, already in construction. Um, but as a result, we've been able to grow up a, a fairly um, robust uh, portfolio and, um, and generally uh, speaking, 
have kind of developed over time a an idea about working locally, which is reflected uh, in the show of the gallery and also um, in the projects of ours that I want to talk about uh, now. So um, sort of the first idea of working locally or, or what one's knee-jerk reaction is, is when you're a foreigner uh, in, a, in a new place is to kind of um, notice a characteristic that's very out of context and play it up. And I would um, say that sort of, so the first kind of uh, stage for us was when given the project to do an outdoor cafe, um, we were um, very attracted to the uh, Guatemalan textile tradition. Uh, Guatemala is um, the site of one of the largest concentrations of the living Mayan heritage. And so one cannot help but notice um, the indigenous population and the amount of um, woven textiles. So we um, uh, picked up on this uh, based on uh, trips to the interior of the country, um, uh, a town specifically, San Andres ex Shul, is um, a town where they locally dye uh, natural fiber um, uh, for uh, the production of these textiles. So the roofs of these um, cinder block buildings are terraced uh, with drying um, skeins of thread. Um, and uh, so for, uh, let's see, where does this go? Yeah. So um, this, was, this was essentially our, our inspiration for designing an outdoor, um, an outdoor commercial space and using, using this idea of the, the pergola, the outdoor uh, restaurant, which is very common in, in a kind of uh, temperate climate, uh, and being inspired by the, the weaving and the, and the different um, curation of, uh, of an existing local technique. So again, being an outsider, we simply applied a little um, design intelligence and kind of uh, isolated and elevated an aspect of the de design, which is uh, fairly straightforward, um, a steel structure, um, uh, open steel structure, the, the cafe's open air, again, braziers keep it warm, and uh, it is fronting uh, bamboo gardens and, and some uh, water features. The uh, other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, this idea of uh, pattern and, and nature, uh, you know, bringing the outside in is something that architects talk about a lot. It's something that you hear a lot in modern architecture. But uh, when really for us nature or natural feeling is it a is about a layering of color and texture. And in this image, going one step farther, where there's actually um, phases of natural materials that are rustic in that they are prepared to be used. So uh, the cut logs are different than the, than the uh, live trees, but there's a sort of latent potential built into the aesthetic of material that's ready to be used. It's kind of stacked and ready to be deployed in some form. And so that was, oh, let me see if I can show you the, yeah, you get it. That's kind of the idea with the thread skeins. They are ordered and ready to be used uh, as part of the tectonic process of the, the, the dyeing, the, the spooling, the dyeing, the, the weaving um, of, of uh, of textile tradition. So this is kind of how all these things come together. The, um, the thread skeins act as a light baffle and an acoustic baffle for the outdoor space. So again, there's a very kind of prosaic and pragmatic uh, aspect to the work, but also uh, a little bit of a, uh, a, uh, a, a an attempt to highlight a local uh, element and, and give it kind of an unexpected treatment, which ends up being the, the showpiece of the, of the project and what distinguishes it, but also, again, the, the layering of colors, textures uh, that help to create this uh, palpable feeling of being outdoors. And also, uh, you have to also imagine the sound of water, the, the rustling of the bamboos, et cetera. So, um, the other, 
side to this uh, appropriation of culture is that by isolating and elevating, you can also um, fall too much into a kind of um, kitsch aspect. And so the sort of second phase uh, as our studio progressed is to reflect culture, uh, to really try to understand not just the ideal of the, of the let's say, the, the quaint uh, local tradition that you see through your blinders as, as maybe a tourist, but what is the, what is the reality on the ground? And um, so uh, for this next project, um, a, a kind of another interest in our studio is the, the reimagining of systems. Obviously, uh, we work in a developing country where uh, certain standards uh, around urban growth, sustainability are, are not on the table, uh, despite these countries developing at a far rapid pace um, without the regulation. And um, so when we were given the commission along the, the main highway that leads outside of uh, Guatemala City in Mexico, um, we were um, confronted with an, sort of the, the, the realities of, of urban sprawl um, and the commercial advertising and, and all of the above. So um, to kind of highlight the issues uh, around urban sprawl uh, and also to address some of these issues around uh, address some of these issues around sustainability. We created um, kind of a giant cube, a four-sided billboard, and welded um, car chassis of kind of a local, uh, uh, I want to say shitbox, but <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a Datsun. It's, it's kind of like the, uh, the worst, the worst, the, the kind of average, it's called a choque is when you crash cars. So um, this is like the Choke car, right? It's always going to be like the worst car on the road. So, um, so on the exteriors of this kind of four-sided billboard, um, the idea is to catch passers-by at the various speeds uh, that the highway features, which is either zooming out uh, of the city or stuck in traffic when you're, when you're um, returning. So again, another commercial project, which we really look to as a, uh, a project of public art. Um, James Wines and his work with the best stores is a big influence. We had the pleasure of um, lecturing with him uh, a few months ago, and he took us out to Chinese food. So that was, that was pretty fun, too. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, the project uh, from the exterior is very uh, uh, separate from the interior. Uh, again, a four-sided billboard. Uh, with uh, that kind of blocks out the context and inside uh, is a, a kind of urban oasis um, in meant to, let's see, ah, yeah. So uh, a bit of an urban oasis that highlights all of the natural systems. Uh, so it's um, sawtooth skylight uh, daylighting, um, the uh, rainwater uh, is collected in the bright blue tanks, um, which makes one of the elevations. Uh, that rainwater is used to feed the um, fountains and the 15-foot uh, palm trees that uh, compartmentalize the interior, and the whole space is um, naturally ventilated. So, uh, and then again, a kind of layering of local materials, patterns, and textures um, to convey, uh, in this case, um, the sensation of being outside, being indoors. So uh, local patio tiles are combined with a custom-made tile uh, to create these, um, this kind of uh, carpets of tiled area, but uh, reclaiming uh, some, some material and mixing it with some new uh, and layering up all of these flavors and colors um, to really create the feeling of being in a, in a tropical space, in a tropical climate, uh, next to next to a very smoggy uh, highway, and this is how all of those things kind of come together. So you can see the 
the, the, the reclaimed water tanks really um, coming to the forefront, but they actually, to me, look more like uh, the, the sort of service box um, that's to the side that houses the kitchen, bathrooms, and employees area feels more like a, a kind of gas station, repair station, and, uh, and the uh, exposed scaffolding kind of has this, uh, uh, as if like the decorated shed uh, had kind of been pulled out and created a, a room inside it. Uh, so this, this ties in, um, the, the, the upholstery has uh, local textiles used, local floor tiles mixed with um, kind of the language of big box retail that's all uh, imported from different countries um, to spur the, uh, spur the, the sprawl. Uh, the sort of the third um, the third phase that evolved of working locally after sort of mining the culture for for things that were different, reflecting the culture for things that are maybe both local and global issues at the same time uh, was to see how we could actually start shaping culture beyond making a visual impact which would generate discussion, it's great, but also how could we begin to educate people from the youngest possible age? So similar to Renzo's office, where, which has a kind of uh, in-house internship residency program, we decided to start our own, which was a bad idea. The, the, <laughs> um, the, uh, this slide talks about something, uh, a term which I learned from a graphic designer uh, who did our branding, Benjamin Critton. And uh, he talked about the difference between fine art and applied art. And I don't know which one architecture is, but I think it has to be both. And um, there isn't, uh, well, I think, I think the need to teach basic tool literacy, basic construction, et cetera, is, is paramount. And it's something that we have had to reteach ourselves. Um, part of taking the plunge as young architects is uh, having to cut your uh, learning by doing um, from everything from uh, how buildings get put together on site to how do you um, uh, interact with clients and, and promote yourself to the world at large. So in addition to uh, Taller Ken, we also uh, started the Fundamental Design Build Initiative. This came about um, when we were awarded the AIA New Practices Award, um, we uh, were operating in the very small corner of the world. Um, and suddenly, uh, we were receiving 10 resumes, 30 resumes a day. And uh, this kind of created probably a typical problem that most uh, architecture offices uh, face, where there's uh, a huge amount of talent and not a lot of work. So not only did we find that these um, young people had an incredible amount of enthusiasm and energy just to come and work for us, but also were um, very sympathetic to the fact that they didn't seem to be finding any other opportunities uh, besides applying to our studio, uh, or at least having, having a poor time of it. And um, so faced with this problem, also how to compare uh, let's say a student from a school on one side of the world uh, from, from a, a very uh, meaningful student from another side of the world. So um, how, do you, how do you kind of uh, compare, compare apples and oranges? And so our approach was to just hire everyone who applied to our office. Now, that, um, that was... <laughs> Uh, uh, resulted in these students. So, so we made kind of a proposal 
uh, to the people who applied basically was that if you come down to Guatemala, uh, we will do something. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it worked. Um, uh, so uh, I think uh, maybe one of these uh, wonderful young people is here. Uh, so these, um, yes, five minutes. Oh, crap. Goodness. Excuse my language. I will go through this very quickly. All right. So uh, in the end, these great young people ended up designing and building something. Um, it's a, uh, a um, temporary installation in the uh, parking lot of a disused, uh, disused parking lot of the Civic Theater. Uh, basically, the program takes you through um, construction, uh, design conception, construction, uh, development, building it yourself, and promoting it, and seeking sponsor companies. Um, all of this in three months. The, the project ended up being uh, a big success using recycled materials and donated materials and um, connecting with the local community that it serves. Um, it also influenced very much the students, I think, who Guatemala wasn't necessarily a place where they would have um, considered coming before, but ended up kind of, um, the country ended up leaving an impact on them. And they ended up uh, leaving an impact on the city as well, making something of quite uh, an impressive scale, I think. Um, we ran this project again the following year, and because of the nature of the first project was temporary uh, and, and sort of uh, tied with the civic institution, we decided to um, do something that was a little more um, working in a community, so uh, working in Barrio Jarona, which is one of the most uh, troubled areas in Guatemala City. It's a red light uh, area and has... Um, a lot of problems. Uh, we ended up doing something that was a little more engaged in terms of um, working with the community uh, to do lasting improvements, which mostly included a lot of concrete and, um, and planting. Uh, so sort of, again, the kind of way that the program works is that uh, our company provides the seed, the core is these um, international students, and then the next ring out is uh, local students and experts that contribute their skill set as well. And then finally, um, cultural uh, sponsor institutions and, and uh, donors, donor companies. Um, so what's been interesting uh, about both projects is in both projects, there's been a, a kind of a subsequent, uh, someone has inherited the project each time. So for uh, the first project, uh, and a Saturday orphans program ended up taking over the space, which originally didn't have any program intent. It was just kind of a pavilion, uh, but it ended up uh, being a, a backdrop for um, this child uh, youth program. And then uh, for the second iteration in uh, a group uh, called Happy People, uh, a kind of youth organization ended up uh, coming back to that site and doing more initiatives with the community. So uh, the program has really uh, served to kind of plant that seed uh, to allow relationships to grow. Uh, and then, uh, so um, the third iteration of this is taking place right now in, in Costa Rica, uh, where we have another amazing group of 10 architects from seven countries, and um, they've identified a site uh, that uh, has a, a sustainability component and an ecology component as well, um, mixing together urban infrastructure with natural systems, uh, including uh, the urban river, the Rio Torres, as well as air and water, uh, so contaminated river, Rio Torres, and uh, the air pollution, as well as um, favela structures that are on the riverbank and, uh, and kind of more affluent communities that use the park for recreational purposes. So for the past two weeks, they've been in San Jose um, meeting all the right people and, and uh, also having a good time. So we'll see what they come up with. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>